Um, tonight, um, mainly going to focus on the ecology notes. Uh, if you have those handy, if you've made copies of them, that would be fine. Um, if you don't have copies, don't worry. If you've got a notebook there and you want to take a few notes, I'll try to uh, give you some definitions that are uh, in the handout and that you can um, write down something there and it might help you out getting things done. And so just, just give a few preliminary notes while people may be scrambling around getting a notebook or something, pencil and paper, or whatever. Um, we're going to try to do this kind of live streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at nine o'clock. Um, I, I guess that's going to work out. If it's not, you know, and a bunch of you want to get together and say, hey, we want to move it to a different time. That's fine. Um, a lot of the teachers are doing things in the mornings. And my feeling is, is that uh, you're more likely to watch something like this in the evening. If you would like it later, that's fine with me. Uh, if you've got favorite TV shows or things that you want to watch and you don't have a, a recording device, that's, that's fine. It's all right with me. Um, but if you've got your, your ecology notes at the top, it says abiotic factors. Uh, abiotic means that it, we're talking mainly about non-living things. Uh, we will get into some things that relate to living things because you can't separate non-living and living. Ecology is a study of, of interactions. It's a study of, of how organisms interact with their environment, how the environment affects them, how they infect, affect the environment. Uh, it's, it has a, a study that has really kind of caught on about the 1960s. Uh, there was a, a woman by the name of Rachel Carson. Uh, you need to write that name down, Rachel Carson. And she wrote a book called Silent Spring, Silent Spring. And this was a uh, kind of an eye opener to a lot of people. It was, it was a kind of a popular book for uh, non-science type folks. It wasn't written strictly for scientists. Um, it's, it's well written. It's, it's still relevant today. And she focused on a lot of the problems that the environment was having. Uh, with development and uh, industrial pollution. And, and in specific, one thing that she was well known for uh, is kind of chronicling the problems that the environment and, and animals and were in particular, in particular birds, were having with a substance called DDT. That's DDT. And it's an insecticide and was used uh, since the 1940s extensively back in the 1950s as a mosquito control and eventually uh, farmers picked it up and began to use it in farms and it got into uh, the water system uh, washed into the water system and uh, sometimes they'd spray water water aquatic ecosystems with this to try to control mosquitoes uh, mosquitoes of course would be infected affected by it and the fish would eat the mosquitoes and then bigger fish would eat them and it, it gradually moved up the food chain and concentrated more and more and more until when it got to uh, uh, things like ospreys and bald eagles who were fish eating birds, um, it concentrated enough in their fatty tissues, which fatty tissues are very common around the uh, egg producing <clears throat> uh, organs in the bird that this then uh, caused the shells of the birds to uh, be very brittle, and uh, the bird would just sit on the nest and, and shatter most of the eggs. And so uh, by the 1970s and 1980s, DDT was banned uh, in the United States and is still available ar around the world in various places, but it, it um, is credited, that, that ban is credited with helping uh, bring back uh, some of the bird populations that um, that like bald eagle and the osprey and such. So that's kind of where everything got started. In 1960s, they were very, uh, folks were very adamant about uh, trying to protect the environment. And a lot of things came about, not, not the least of which 
is uh, several federal agencies began to get involved in this, and some were created in response to this. For example, on the first page of the uh, handout on ecology abiotic notes, uh, one of the things I go over are various kinds of agencies. Uh, most of them are federal agencies, um, but uh, to, uh, I think one in particular is a, a state agency. And the one I'm referring to that was created in response to a lot of the concern over the environment was what's called the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. And uh, this uh, agency has a tremendous amount of power. It uh, mainly works through uh, two in particular acts, uh, the Clean Water Act and the uh, Species Protection Act or the Endangered Species Protection Act. Now the Endangered Species Protection Act uh, is uh, one of the things that, or is, I guess, the primary thing that stopped the completion of the Teleco Dam project in the 1970s. Uh, I can remember that I was taking ecology at UT in Knoxville uh, the spring of 1972, and uh, the professor wanted us to uh, take a trip through the Smokies, and we spent the night at, at Tremont, which is a uh, uh, kind of a study institute in outside of Townsend, Tennessee. And one of the things that we, we went by was the Teleco Dam. And, and it was it, the dam itself, the gates of the dam were open. And um, the thing that stopped it was a little fish called the snail darter. You've probably heard of that. Uh, interestingly enough, when I worked for the Forest Service some years after that, I had an occasion to invite the one of the lead scientists in this project uh, in studying the snail darter uh, to uh, Indian Boundary. He he brought slides and he did a program for the campers up there. I was kind of amazed that he came up there, but he did. He was very gracious, and he and I talked afterwards. and And he knew, you know, my background being a, ma a master's degree in biology, and and uh, he he and I talked and. Um, he uh, is kind of uh, interesting that he said that the, the main thing about snail darter is they used it as a tool to stop TVA. The uh, Teleco Dam project was was kind of the end of a list that TVA had been uh, completing or complete a, pro a list of projects they were completing uh, since probably the 1930s and uh, certainly 1940s. And uh, most of the early projects in the in the early years of the TVA were designed for flood control and for production of electricity. By the time it got to uh, the construction of the Teleco Dam project, uh, neither of those things was the purpose of the Teleco Dam project. Teleco Dam project was a development project for uh, the development of the land around the Teleco Dam. And that's interesting, and that brings up another uh, concept that's also mentioned uh, on the uh, second uh, page of the handout. And it's concept, uh, it's a legal concept called eminent domain. That's eminent, eminent, I M I, or I M M I N E N T I M N. Let me repeat now I M N I N. E N T domain. It's a legal concept. It's it's pretty well accepted, and the courts have back. You know, as long as a federal agency or a state agency or even a, a municipal agency has a project in mind that they they need a certain uh, property or properties, that if it is for the general good and uh, something that uh, that they have to do and in, in for the good of the people then they can give the person that owns that land or that property a fair market price. And then that would uh, allow them to take that property. But again, they have to pay the person a fair market price. And so for the Teleco Dam project, the farmlands around there uh, were the people in the farmlands were given probably about, oh, 200, 300, maybe at the most $500 an acre. And at, at that time, that was a fair market price. And in, in fact, that was probably if at $500 an acre would have been a, a great price at that time. 
uh, so probably much less than that. Nowadays, an acre of land next to Teleco Lake uh, goes for well over a million dollars and, and probably closer to two or three million dollars an acre, if you can find it. And uh, that has made many of the landowners, I, I actually talked to one of them some years ago, and he was very bitter toward TVA. Um, and when the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was established, they also uh, took land from people there. And uh, that also the folks were very, very bitter. So it's a concept called the eminent domain and state agencies, federal agencies and municipalities, city agencies can also use that. Um, going back to these agencies that are listed here, the only one that is a state agency is called Tennessee Wildlife Life Resources Agency. The state of Tennessee owns uh, or has control of the wildlife in the state, including fisheries. And uh, the state legislature is the one that actually passes game laws. Now, that's that's something that people oftentimes don't recognize. They think the Forest Service, um, Cherokee National Forest, actually makes game laws, and that's not true. The state aid, the state legislature makes game laws, and Tennessee uh, Wildlife Resources Agency, TWRA, enforces those laws and administers those laws. Um, now, the Forest Service does have uh, some impact. They, they can uh, suggest and they can uh, certainly uh, have to do have things to do about the the habitat of various animals, uh, but they do not make the game laws. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service is under the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it is uh, a agency that could be categorized as conservation. Conservation involves wise use of resources, uh, meaning that they're not locking natural resources away, but they are actually um, having those resources work for people. In other words, they sell timber, they sell uh, mining rights, they sell mostly timber recreation, uh, those kind of things. They, they are very, very much involved with those, but they're involved in soil conservation. Uh, they're involved in management of streams. Uh, they're involved in, in the purity of the water, the, clean, the cleanliness of the water, uh, lots of things that they are involved in, but mostly in terms of using them wisely uh, so that they can have uses uh, of these resources in years to come, which is called sustained yield, sustained yield. And so they're a multi-use uh, organization. Now, the contrast that with the uh, U.S. Park Service, which is the agency, it's in the Department of the Interior, but the U.S. Park Service is uh, the agency in charge of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, um, and many of you, I'm sure, have visited that park, you know, and that's that's park service. That's different. Uh, the Cherokee National Forest is not a park. It is a national forest. Great Smoky Mountains uh, is a national park. There is a difference. And in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, um, the key word is preservation. Uh, they want to preserve things. Now, several examples of this. For example, I was, I was just reading an article uh, a few minutes ago about black bear. And, in the, and there is no hunting in the uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, you can fish there. Uh, but there is no hunting. Uh, you and I can't go up there and hunt. Uh, and, and they uh, want to promote native species. Now, there is a non-native species that they've for years tried to get rid of and not really been very successful, and that's the wild hog. Uh, the European wild hog was introduced into the mountains of East Tennessee in the early 1900s. And um, that mi they mixed very quickly with the domestic hog. And uh, it's almost as if the wild hog's genetic traits uh, kind of overwhelmed those of the domestic hog. And so that most hogs that you see in the mountains are black. They have real stiff, bristly hair along their back. They have a long tail, uh, characteristics that you don't often see in domestic hogs. Um, but they're non-native. And so the Park Service has for years been wanting to try to get rid of those. They have even at times have have had employees of the Park Service 
tunnel. I've had students that uh, were involved in this and uh, I would see them every now and then and I'd say, hey, you know, have you, you killed many hogs? And they'd, they'd say, yeah, we would kill three or four and, and uh, they trap them. Has been big in trapping. Uh, Tennessee is, in, is big in trapping at, at times. Um, but the idea is to preserve the park is the way it, the way they, in a particular time period, what they want. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, Case Cove, for example, if you go back to the time when the park was first established and look at the number of houses in Caves Cove, it's probably four or five times what you see there now. And uh, almost uh, none of the houses that were in the Caves Cove area uh, showed a log appearance. Now, they may have had logs under uh, the uh, in the original building of the house, but it was considered to be more modern and uh, kind of keeping up with the times that they covered up the logs with with boards. And so houses would be uh, have board siding. They may have a log interior. They may have several rooms in addition to the original log room. In other words, the houses were pretty nice. Uh, there was a school there. Uh, they preserved most of the churches. I think maybe all the churches. And uh, but the point is, is that the Park Service picked a particular time period. Uh, late 1800s Case Co. Uh, structures to show late 1800s. And so that's the reason you see most of them are, are log. Not all of them are, but most of them are log. Um, but that's preservation. Now, there is another uh, agency that we don't run into very much around here. It's called the Bureau of Land Management. And they manage uh, mostly lands west of the Mississippi. Very big into mining rights and grazing, and uh, they're uh, again under the Department of the Interior, and they are more of a conservation type group. Uh, there's another one, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they, in, in terms of what we run into about them, if you're a duck hunter, a goose hunter, uh, they uh, determine the game laws there because geese and ducks uh, cross state lines very regularly. They're a migratory species and therefore under the control of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the, you need to be aware of the Clean Water Act um, gives the EPA a tremendous amount of authority. The Cherahala Highway was actually stopped in the early, uh, early 1970s uh, because uh, they, when they got up to the top of the mountain, they cut into rock that had a lot of sulfur in it. And the sulfur mixed with the water and formed sulfuric acid. And that flowed into the streams that then flow into North River. And it, it caused the, the water to be uh, too acidic. And it killed a lot of the aquatic uh, uh, organisms in those streams. And so they stopped it. And uh, they then uh, figured out a way to uh, continue building the road by doing some things. Uh, for example, and this is kind of weird. Uh, you you probably won't believe me until you go up there and actually look at this. But on some of the the, the you get up on on the highway up toward the top, and some of the slopes that were sloping down toward North River. If you get on those, you'll notice. And and uh, I haven't actually in the last probably 20 years, but uh, they sprayed them with they they first of all put down uh, limestone rock, spread them all over those those hillsides. And then they sprayed it with fiberglass and the fiberglass was supposed to keep the rocks from sliding off. And it's kind of weird to look, go down through there and you see the, all these rocks and everything and you see fiberglass holding them in place. Now they may still not be there, may not be there, but you should probably still be able to find some evidence of that. And that was pretty successful. And they went ahead and, and finished the road. And, um, and that uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, that was EPA. And one of the things they require is what's called an environmental impact state or an IEP uh, or EI, uh, environmental EIS, I guess is what you would say. And um, uh, sometimes it is called an impact statement. And so anytime anybody wants to build a road, for example, it goes across federal or state lands, they have to have an environmental impact statement, a statement that says the effect of this road on wildlife, plants, uh, soil quality, and in particular, water quality. 
and erosion. So they're, they're very careful about those kind of things. If they don't like what's going on, then they can stop the road. Uh, in addition, uh, in, this is particularly out in, in desert areas out west. Person have 10 to 15 acres out there or five acres and, you know, and they, they build their house and, and everything's hunky dory and they know oh, we want to clear some land out here and have a pasture or something like that. Well, if there is a, a desert tortoise out there, which actually builds a burrow underground uh, and the EPA finds out about it, they can stop them from doing that. Uh, so there's a, a tremendous amount of power there. And uh, the idea is to protect the environment. Now, let's kind of shift gears a little bit here. Uh, and go down to uh, some terms that are at the bottom of the second page. And we're really not going to get into these a lot uh, until later. But I'm going to go ahead and give you some definitions, some real simple definitions for these. If you don't have these pages in front of you, uh, the first one is called mutualism, M-U-T-U-A-L-I-S-M, mutualism. And real simply, it simply means that two organisms interact where both benefit. Both organisms benefit from the interaction. Um, a, a simple example of this would be a lichen that you see growing on the side of a tree. That says gray spots you see on trees. Uh, that's actually composed of two organisms. One is the fungus, uh, which pr provides a container in which the second organism, an algae, lives. Now, the algae is photosynthetic. It produces food. And so that's food for the fungus. And the fungus then provides a place for the algae to live. Now, one of the other interesting things about lichens, L-I-C-H, uh, ENS lichens is that uh, they are an indicator species. Uh, if you see lichens growing on trees, then that area uh, probably has pretty decent um, uh, air quality. But if you don't see a lot of lichens, say, for example, you go to Chattanooga or to downtown Knoxville, you don't see lichens, you don't see those gray spots on the trees. That means that the air quality is 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 too bad for that. Uh, they're 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 sensitive to that kind of thing. So that's mutualism. Commensalism is where one organism benefits, the other one is not affected. One organism benefits and the other one is not affected. Uh, you probably won't see this unless you're around cattle a lot, but. You may notice that uh, cattle walking through a field, you may have uh, some birds following the cows. And the cow is, is not benefiting from it, that relationship, but the bird follows the cows so that as the cow walks through the grass, they stir up insects and the bird eats them. And so the bird's going to benefit from that, uh, but the cow doesn't. That's commensalism. Uh, parasitism. Everybody knows what a parasite is. Okay. And... Uh, tick on a dog, fleas on a dog. Uh, those are parasites. Okay. Now, the most efficient parasite is is one that does not kill its host. Uh, that's the most. If it kills its host, then it, it's killed. You know, it does. It's run. It's it's out of a place to live. It's out of food to eat. And so, the most efficient is one that does not kill its host. Uh, but that's a parasitic relationship. One organism is actually harmed, but the other organism benefits. Uh, predation is another relationship like this, but in this case, the prey organism is actually killed. The predator organism then benefits a bobcat and a rabbit. The prey is the is the rabbit. The predator is the bobcat. Obviously, the uh, bobcat is going to benefit from that relationship, but the rabbit, of course, is going to be killed by the bobcat for food. Now, down below that is what's called habitat requirements. Now, habitat is where an organism lives, okay, where an organism lives. Um, and there are specific things that organisms have to have in their habitat. If those things are not there, then the organism won't be there. Now, some very general things here I want to get into. Um, plants have three requirements in general. 
One is water, another is light, and the third is minerals. Plants require water, light, and minerals. Animals, again, have, they have three general requirements, and that is water and shelter. Uh, for example, the article I was reading about a black bear, uh, it, it, the article itself didn't get into this. It, it, uh, I didn't read all of it. Uh, but one of the things we've learned about black bear is they, they have to, the, the sows, the mama bear has to have shelter. And most uh, mama bears will actually get into a big hollow tree, and that's where they'll have their cubs in the winter. And if, if the bear doesn't have access to those big hollow trees, then the population of bears suffers because of that. So one of the things, uh, again, showing an interaction with the Forest Service is TWRA comes along and says, hey, we want to uh, promote bears in this area. So when you cut timber in there, uh, have the people that cut timber not cut the big hollow trees. And so the Forest Service is happy to, to help out in that regard. So uh, that, that, again, is animals require food, they require water, and they require shelter. Plants require water, light, and minerals. Water, light, and minerals. Now, the range is where uh, an organism might be found. And, and this is not um, in terms of uh, maybe just in a small acre area or two acre area. We're talking about counties or states are part of a continent where an organism might be found. Those are the kind of things that we're referring to as a range. Um, so it's where an organism might be found. Territory is the area an organism will defend. Now, obviously, we're not talking about plants here, uh, but a, uh, the area a black bear will defend is its territory. The area that a uh, buck, a white-tailed deer, a male white-tailed deer will defend is its territory. And in the case of white-tailed deer, that would include the does that he considers part of his, uh, his family, okay? So that is territory, and that oftentimes involves some very um, amazing behavior and very, uh, very complicated behavior in some respects in terms of, of what they would defend. And we may get into those kind of things later on. Now, if we get to the, the next page of your handout, uh, at the top there, you have a term called niche. Niche, to put it real simply, is the job that an organism has, the job it has in its ecosystem, in its habitat. Um, for example, if I go out the back door, see a bunch of trees, uh, what is the tree's job? What is, what is its niche? Well, its niche is to, uh, uh, as a green plant, to produce food. And it provides homes for animals, uh, it provides food for animals, and that's, that's its niche. And what's the niche of the squirrel? The niche of the squirrel is to live in trees and eat nuts. That's its niche. What is the, the niche of a hawk that flies through? Its niche is to prey on the squirrels. And so you have all these relationships that develop that in terms of what the job of the organism is. What is its niche? Now, organisms in terms of their niche are oftentimes placed in very simple categories. Producers are usually green plants. They are autotrophs, A-U-T-O-T-R-O-P-H-S, autotrophs. And they produce their own food. Producers produce their own food. Consumers do not produce their own food. They consume producers in some respects. In some cases, they, they consume or will consume another animal. But a consumer is a heterotroph. H-E-T-E-R-O-T-R-O-P-H. Heterotroph. H-E-T-E-R-O-P-H. Heterotroph. Now, both the producers and the consumers are eventually going to die and their bodies are going to decompose and the decomposers are primarily bacteria and fungi. 
bacteria and fungi are listed as decomposers. Now, uh, the decomposition process can, also, can, can be fairly complicated in that the decomposers have very specific requirements of temperature and moisture and, and uh, uh, other things that will, you know, pH, other things we'll get into. Now, if you look on down, uh, then we get into the abiotic or the non-living things. And there's three basic categories of non-living things in an ecosystem. The atmosphere is basically the air. Uh, the lithosphere is the soil. And the hydrosphere is the water. Uh, atmosphere is air, lithosphere is soil, hydrosphere is water. Now, when you are doing these, uh, writing this stuff out, uh, you can uh, just simply write the term and write the definition on a piece of paper, and then photograph that and send it to me as a email attachment. That's fine. That's working out fine for a lot of folks. Um, that. I can even make copies of that if I need to, uh, but that's that's working out real good. So again, atmosphere is the air, lithosphere is the soil, hydrosphere is the water. I hate sitting doing all this. You know me; I like to get up and walk around. There's there's no way I can do that. Uh, so if you see me kind of squirming in my seat, it's gonna get tired of sitting. Uh, we've been going over a half hour now, and that's that's unusual for me to sit that long when I'm lecturing. I, I just don't lecture that way. Okay, so you get down to the biotic uh, producers, consumers, decomposers, animal habitat requirements, plant habitat requirements. Those are things we all mentioned. And, uh, and there's nothing that you have to write there. Uh, and we'll get into those later. The abiotic part of the environment, uh, we're going to basically talk about the atmosphere now. So the atmospheric composition, you can see if you've got your notes in front of you, is nitrogen is 78%, oxygen is 20%. And other gases are about 2%. Now, that's nitrogen. That's N2 uh, is 78%. Oxygen, O2, is 20%. And other gases be about 2%. Now, the other gases include things like carbon dioxide. And this is one that's been very um, commonly talked about uh, in the last 10 or 15 years because it's what we call a greenhouse gas. And so they're, they're really worried. Many scientists are really worried about the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Uh, depending on who you talk to, the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is generally around uh, 0 0.04 to around 0.05%. Now, that's not a lot. And that amount is constantly being cycled. I mean, there's carbon dioxide can be absorbed by plants, obviously. That, that's what happens in photosynthesis. And uh, if you increase the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, plants are going to even in, you know, absorb more of it, which will actually help the plant. There's also an interaction between the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the water, the oceans, lakes, rivers. Uh, because they will absorb carbon dioxide as well. They will release carbon dioxide as, as well as absorb carbon dioxide. So uh, there's a constant interaction. And scientists have developed um, uh, several computer models, many computer models, in fact, that try to factor in all of these various interactions. And then scientists would say, hey, you know, because the carbon dioxide concentration is going up, that this is going to affect the temperature of the atmosphere and the Earth. Um, over the next few years, and you see, you see some very, uh, and, and to be frank with you, some very ridiculous uh, predictions uh, that some people, mainly politicians, have made about what the the next uh, uh, 12 years are going to be like, and that's, it, it's it really kind of ridiculous, some of the things that they have uh, proposed. Interestingly enough, one of the side effects of the coronavirus, COVID-19 epidemic uh, has been that people have been driving less and uh, many folks have observed that the amount of, of uh, pollution in the air and even pollution in the water has gone down dramatically. In fact, this uh, we also saw this in 1973. Y'all don't, <laughs> of course you weren't around, but in 1973, there was a, there was a war 
the Israeli war. And uh, there's the, the flow of oil from uh, Saudi Arabia and other uh, Arab countries was stopped or at least slowed. Um, because of that, there was not much, there, there was a scarcity of gas in the United States. People didn't drive as much. There are actually lines of people to try to get gasoline. Um, and you, you saw the air pollution in Chattanooga, for example, uh, the air became much cleaner than what it was in the past. So um, it is, uh, that is, is something that's really open to debate. And, and I'm not going to try to get into all that right now. Uh, wind is simply the movement of air. Now, the movement of air is, is not a random thing. The movement of air um, is due to inequalities, things that aren't equal. If temperatures are not equal from one area to another, it's going to be wind. Uh, why? To In order to try to erase those inequalities. If there's a difference in air pressure from one place to the next, there's going to be wind. And again, in order to try to erase those inequalities. So anytime you see wind here, there is, uh, there's going to be somewhere, there's going to be a low pressure and somewhere is going to be a high pressure. And the wind is trying to equalize those to make it, to make, to get rid of the high pressure and get rid of the low pressure. And you, you equalize them so that the pressure is the same in the area. Okay. The greater the difference between the low pressure and the high pressure, the more wind. Now that's what happens when you have a tornado. A tornado is an extremely low air pressure. And because of that low air pressure, you have a violent inrushing of wind. And that then creates the problems that we, we've seen in the last few weeks. Um, storms are the same way. Most of our, our moisture comes up from the Gulf Stream. Uh, when it runs into a cold air mass coming in from the north, northwest, then there's a difference there. And one of the things that happens is, of course, precipitation. But another thing is winds. And the greater the difference, the more wind. Okay. That's the reason in spring, you have still a lot of uh, like blackberry winter and, and dogwood winter. And you have these cold fronts coming in. And they meet this warm moisture coming up from the Gulf. And you have oftentimes pretty violent thunderstorms, which is what we had this past week. So. Uh, again, going now to the third page of the handout. Now, here you see a lot of the questions will have numbers. And what you can do in terms of making kind of like an answer sheet is simply to put the number two. Uh, you might, uh, a, a matter of convenience, you might put third page. And then number two, warm air rises and cool air sinks. It's real simple. Simple answer, and you don't have to write the whole thing. You can just put number two, third page, sinks. Okay. Then number three, uh, warm air holds more moisture than cool air. And that's a very important thing you need to remember. Warm air will hold more moisture than cool air. And number four, when warm, moist air becomes cooler, then precipitation will occur. Uh, precipitation may be rain, it may be snow, it may be sleet, it may be hail, whatever it is. By the way, whenever you have high winds, uh, generally speaking, that's when you're going to have hail because the the ice, as it falls, generally it gets down to the lower elevations and it melts. That's, then it comes becomes rain. But if there's high winds, it pushes it back up, gets another layer of ice, and then falls down, and then the wind pushes it back up. Whenever it gets heavy enough, that the wind can't push it back up, then it falls to the ground, and we call that hail. That's the reason you cut into a, a hail stone, that it will have layers in it, like the layers of a tree, because it's built up layers of moisture. Number six, where does most of our atmosphere moisture come from? Uh, I, I skipped number five, pardon me. Relative humidity is simply the amount of moisture in air compared to how much total moisture it can hold. So if an air mass has a relative humidity of 80%, that means it can hold 20% more moisture. When it gets up to 100%, it can't hold anymore. 
Now, this gets a little complicated because, again, you, you've got to factor in temperature here. Because as an air mass cools, the amount of moisture it can hold goes down. I'm going to repeat that. As an air mass cools, the amount of moisture it can hold decreases. I'll repeat it again. As an air mass cools, the amount of moisture it can hold decreases. So an air mass may be at 80% relative humidity and then it, it hits cold air and it cools down. Its relative humidity goes up to 100 or 110% and you've got precipitation then. Okay. All right. Now, that's relative humidity. The amount of moisture that an air mass has compared to how much it can hold. Number six, where does most of our atmospheric moisture come from? The Gulf of Mexico. Number six is the Gulf of Mexico. Number seven, from where does most of our cold air come from? Obviously the north, north, northwest. Eight, when the two meet, what happens? Precipitation. Number eight is precipitation. And number nine, clouds are made up of, oddly enough, uh, most people think it's just ice crystal. It's actually ice crystals and dust. The ice crystals actually form around little tiny dust particles. And so uh, it's actually uh, ice crystals and dust. Okay, now I think I'm on the fourth page now. At the top of the fourth page, it says latitude and longitude. Okay, and you've got a little illustration there. Number 10, what are latitude map lines? Latitude lap mines, uh, lines, map lines run from east to west and measure points north to south. Now, skip on down to uh, 14. What is zero degrees latitude is the equator. So as we come further and further north from the equator, our latitude numbers go up until you get to the North Pole where the latitude is 90 degrees. Now, most of your phones, you can actually look up your location and get the latitude and longitude of teleco planes or even in some cases your specific house. Uh, even if you're walking through the woods, sometimes people can get this very very, very specific. Now, number 11, what are longitude lines? Longitude lines run north to south and measure points east to west. In other words, if you're looking at a globe or a map, these are the lines that run vertically. Latitude lines run horizontally. Now, you got to have a zero point on any of these. Now, the equator is zero point for latitude. So where is zero point for longitude? Well, back in the 1800s, the uh, British Empire was the largest empire the world has ever known. And it was held together by their Navy. And the Navy had to travel all over the world trying to hold all this together. And they were exploring. Even Charles Darwin, when he was uh, on the HMS Beagle, the primary person, the HMS Beagle, was not to carry Charles Darwin, uh, but to map. Uh, locations of water sources, uh, valuable minerals, uh, things that they could use in trade to uh, map out uh, shipping lanes um, and, and all this. And, and they had to know their location. And so there had to be a zero point. So the British Empire said, hey, the zero point's going to run through Britain. And so Greenwich, England was the zero longitude. That's what's called a prime meridian. Uh, if you remember the uh, the movie, one of the Thor movies, I can't, Dark World or something like that, um, where the final battle was fought, you know, the aliens came in in their fancy ship and everything, and they plowed through this green type area, and there were students there in, in libraries, and it was obviously a, kind of like a university, and that was the royal, uh, part of the Royal Astronomy Society meets there, that was Greenwich, England, is where that occurred. So. Anyway, that's that's one zero uh, longitude. The other one is out in the middle of the Pacific. And that would be um, number 13. 
middle of the Pacific. Now, people had to get together and agree on this one. It says, my connection is unstable. Please wait. Well, I, I'm hoping you are getting this. I, I guess you are. Um, but the international dateline in the Pacific is something that people came together and agreed on. Britain didn't, didn't control this one. And so one of the things they agreed on is that dateline is going to be zero degrees longitude, but that it would not cross any land. And so it zigzags all over the place. But that's uh, that's in the middle of the Pacific. So, again, 14 is that the equator. Zero degrees latitude is the equator. And in number 15, you can look that up on your phone. Your longitude and latitude where you are. Um, and that's going to be expressed in degrees and minutes and even seconds. <coughs> Excuse me. Longitude and latitude. So uh, you can look that up. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Now, that's that's basically got us to uh, we're, we're coming up on number 16, which is, I think, the the uh, fifth page. I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six page. Pardon me. Uh, in what hemisphere are we? We're in the northern hemisphere, by the way. So number 16 is the northern hemisphere. We're going to stop there. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Anything you want to ask? This particular assignment is, is due on April the 21st. Um, and I think that's a Tuesday of next week. Your virus assignment is coming up pretty quickly. And remember, the virus assignment counts as two test grades. Um, be very careful about doing your graphs. Make sure that they are neat. Uh, make sure they have titles. Make sure your graphs have the x-axis label and the units label. If you don't, I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna count off on those things. And the y-axis, make sure it has is is labeled, and the units are uh, clearly labeled. What the y-axis is, and what the x-axis is, and so. Uh, you, that's going. That part's going to count as a a test grade, and the written part of the virus assignment is going to count as a test grade. So it's a good chance for you to make a hundred on both of those, and those will count as test grades. Now, um, these assignments that you're turning into me again, most people are getting them in really good. Uh, I don't have any bad complaints about this. We're, we don't have as many people watching this tonight. We only had six, seven people watching it. Uh, I'm assuming that the rest of you are uh, picking up on this at a later time, and that's fine. That's fine. I, I, I wanted to do it live stream like that just in case anybody had questions. But again, we're going to try to do this on Tuesday and Thursday nights next week and the following week, um, Tuesday and Thursday night, unless you hear otherwise from me. Uh, at nine o'clock, we're going to try to get together and do this. So if there's no questions, I am going to sign off. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you were able to get some answers on your, your uh, handout, your assignment. Uh, I will do this again on Tuesday of next week. And um, that will be, the, i tell you what, that, that will be the 21st. If you turn your assignment in on the 22nd, that'll be fine with me because we'll, we'll go try to go over most of the other answers on Tuesday of next week, and that should get all that out of the way. So, all right, signing off. We'll see you.